Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's good to be here again, and it's good to be back. Um, if you're here, thank you for watching this. Uh, I appreciate it. If you were with us last week, thank you for being consistent. Um, we're going to start off at the end of 1 Samuel 16, because that's about what we got. And um, we finish up in verse 18. I'm actually really excited to get to verses 19 through 23, because, well, you'll find out in just a second. Um, if you guys do have any suggestions or anything that you would like to hear or any questions about the life of David, you can either message me personally. I don't check Facebook very often, but if you message my Instagram account, I will get it. And if you message uh, um, me personally at my phone, at my phone number, uh, 207-344-7927, I will respond to that. Um, again, that is 207-344-7927. Once again, thank you for listening. We can start in verse 19. Verse 19. We're going to read until the end of the chapter, then we'll pray, and uh, we'll start diving right back into the life of David. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse, and said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread, and a bottle of wine, and a kid, and sent them by David his son of Saul. And David came to Saul and stood before him. And he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from the God was upon Saul, that David took an heart and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Uh, I'm going to pray and let's get into it. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this opportunity to die today. It really is an opportunity to uh, get up and talk about your word, get up and preach about your word, dear Lord. Help, uh, help me uh, articulate, well, help me to uh, say what I should say. Say as you want me to say to you. Uh, Lord, uh, please bless me. And use me in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. So at the end of last week, we touched on music and how music is an important part of a, Christian, of a Christian's life, especially a Christian young person's life. Uh, the right kind of music will set the tone. The right kind of music will, um, it, it, will make, it will help you think in certain ways. There, there's this section of science, music psychology, and uh, stores use it, malls use it, uh, and the reason is because you go to the pace of your music. So inside a store, they tend to, tend to, this is not 100% true, but they will tend to play slower music. Slower music, because they want you to spend more time in the store, because the more time you are in the store, the more chance you have to find something. You can check that if you want, if you walk into the mall and you can hear it, because it's, it's, it's there. Unless it's a specific type of store that's trying to do something else with the music, the music will generally be slow. Just because they, they, they are trying to make you spend more money there. And it's music, it's music psychology. You go to the pace of the music. If you run, runners will often listen to higher tempo music, because you will match the pace of your music without even thinking about it. Music helps you in different ways, and music affects how you think on a base level sometimes. And like, this is, again, why it's so important to listen to the right kind of music. I don't want to keep talking about what I talked about last week, uh, especially when I, there's a lot of stuff to get into this week. We're going to try and dive into verse 17 here in a second, too. Um, and uh, when Saul, Saul heard the right kind of music, the evil spirit from the Lord departed from him. And that just shows what music can do. Music soothes, music depresses. Everyone has that sad playlist. Uh, everyone would be like, this is a song that I listen to when I'm sad. And they're depressing and they make me sadder. I don't understand that, by the way. If, actually, if somebody could explain that to me, somebody's tried to before. And I, and I was just like, that doesn't make any sense. And I think they said, now I'm sad because of the song. I'm not sad because I'm sad anymore. I'm like, but you're still sad. I don't understand this. Um, and I still don't understand it. So if someone wants to tell me how that works, I would appreciate that. Um, but uh, moving off the top of music, let's talk about Saul for a minute. Saul was the first uh, king of Israel. Uh, he was from the tribe of Benjamin. And this is early on in Saul's life. Saul starts off pretty well. Uh, we see he's already been rejected. That happened in 1 Samuel 15, but at the beginning of Saul's life, he started off very humble. He started off very, he thought very low of himself when he first started off. He was uh, 
his, he was a man of great stature. He was head and shoulders above everyone else. You see that early on in 1 Samuel when he's first elected to be king. You also see that when he was being announced king, he went and hid. He went and hid himself, and part of it, he hid him on his stuff because he didn't think he was supposed to be king. He didn't think he was worthy of being king. And you see that early on in Saul's life, and that was when Saul was excellent. That was when Saul was great. When Saul did great things for Israel. Now we're getting on a little bit later. We see in 1 Samuel 15 that God rejected Saul. And we know that the path that Saul leads down uh, with this route with him trying to chase David and kill David. But let's look at the beginning of this path for a second because I don't think everybody realizes what happens at the end of this path. In verses 19 through 23, what we just read, uh, start in verse 21. And David came to Saul and stood before him and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. He became his armor bearer. One, he, he loved him greatly. Saul loved David. Saul loved what David did. So David played the harp for Saul, and Saul loved it. Saul loved him. And then not only did he love him, he gave him positioning. He made him the king's armor bearer. The king's armor bearer, the, the job is self-explanatory. He bore, he bared Samuel's armor, uh, Saul's, Saul's armor. He carried it into battle before. Um, the armor bearer was also, also, you're going to see later on in 1 Samuel 17, uh, an armor bearer also carried, uh, helped protect the king in the field of battle. He helped carry his shield for him, before him in the field of battle. And that's an important job as, as protecting the king. If the king died, the armor bearer was in trouble too. You see when Jonathan dies later on in this chapter, uh, his armor bearer um, fled. He ran away after Jonathan, um, after Jonathan was killed. Because he was caught, he was going to be killed too. By either side at that point because he let Jonathan die. That was his job. And um, so we see all of that. And we see how much Dave, Saul loved David. But then later on, we see in this book, when Saul is chasing David down, David's on the run for his life from Saul, from Saul and his army. Saul is trying to kill David, the man that he once loved, the man that he thought of so highly that he made him his armor bearer, the man that he trusted so much that he trusted him to protect him in battle. He was now chasing and preparing to put him to death. How did that happen? Well, the answer it starts off with jealousy. In 1 Samuel 17, uh, 1 Samuel um, 17, and then at the beginning of verse 18, at uh, the beginning of chapter 18, we're going to touch on this again later. When Saul, uh, I'm, I'm actually just going to go there real quick. 18, starting verse 5. And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him, and behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, he was accepted in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. And it came to pass, as they came, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of the all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing, to meet King Saul with taverns, with joy, with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they played, And Saul has slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very raw, and the same displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom? And Saul's jealousy, his jealousy consumed him. His jealousy consumed him so that the person that he once loved, he didn't even see who that person was anymore. He saw what they represented. What, who what he thought them as. And David was great young man. It just said that he behaved himself wisely before King Saul. He, he, was, he, he held himself well before a king. It didn't matter how wisely he behaved. It didn't matter what he accomplished. The more, the more good David did, the more jealous Saul became. Because Saul's like, I want that. I want my name there. They've ascribed unto me but thousands? Only thousands? Which is an incredibly impressive feat. But because they ascribed to David more, he became jealous about it. 
And that is something that we need to look out at. I remember, I remember, I grew up and my best friend was Brian Hewitt. If you know Brian, you know what I'm about to say. And Brian is a phenomenal athlete. He is good at every sport. You, you might be thinking, he can't be good at every sport. See, I keep thinking that too. And I keep getting proved wrong in an annoying fashion. Because, oh, this is a new game. Let's play. Let's play this new game. And Brian will win. And then he will always win. If I know the game and Brian doesn't know the game, I will win the first one. And then Brian will win all the other ones. And it's just the way it goes. And I remember when I was in high school, when I was a younger, ninth, 10th grade, I struggled. I was jealous of all the accolades that Brian received. But that was my friend. I love him. I care about him. I should have no reason to be jealous about that. There's no reason for me to be to want that. It's because I wanted what he had and because I wanted it to be about me. And that is incredibly selfish. That was incredibly selfish. I should have just been happy that he was blessed with such talents, with such gifts. And it's the exact same thing here. Saul loved David. Saul trusted David. Saul, Saul raised David up in positioning. But then, when David started getting so much, Saul became bitter. Saul became angry. Saul became jealous. To the point where he could not stand the sight of David. The evil spirit from the Lord would fall upon Saul, and David would try to play from him four times. And twice, twice, Saul took a javelin and threw it at David so that he might smite him to the wall. His friend that he loved. He became so jealous he wanted to smite him to the wall. Where have we become jealous in our lives? Where have we decided that we don't see even that person anymore? We just see everything that they have that we want for ourselves that we selfishly desire, that we chase after. And there's a reason that Saul didn't get this. Saul became king. When Saul became king, he was very humble. He was very, very, he had, he had a lot of humility, and he was a good king when Saul became king. But the longer he became, he was king, the worse he became. Because the longer he was king, he stopped seeing himself as low as his own sight, and he started lifting himself up. Saul didn't get all of this because Saul couldn't handle all of this. Saul didn't get all of this because of, can you imagine if Saul went into the kingdom and he said, they saying about Saul, he's killed his ten thousands. Well, Saul would have been pretty puffed up then. Saul would have thought, oh, yeah, I have killed my ten thousands. I mean, I am that. I can't, I am that. And Saul wouldn't have been able to handle it. And the spiral would have continued. The spiral would have gotten worse. He would have become a worse king and a worse king and a worse king. And maybe we don't have what everyone else has. Maybe we don't have what that one person has that you just want. That you want their stuff. You want their talents. You want their abilities. And maybe we don't have that because we can't handle that. Maybe we don't have that because Jesus is looking at us and going, If I gave you that, you would never talk to me. You would, never, you would never come see me. You would never read about me. If I gave you all those gifts, talents, and abilities, you would be so enthralled with your gifts, talents, and abilities, you would forget the God that gave you those gifts, talents, and abilities. And it's so important. It's so important that we remember who made us what we are. It is impossible, it is impossible to be jealous of someone. When you stop and you think, God gave them that. And then maybe in a moment of self-reflection you can think, and God gave me everything he gave me. And we have no right, we have no right to 
covet, to be jealous of, to be bitter towards something that somebody else has, some abilities that somebody else has. When God gave us everything. If we think anything that we have done is from ourselves, if we think we have done anything without God's permission, I have, the reason I breathe is because God allows me to breathe. The reason I walk is because God lets my legs move. The reason I talk is because God lets my mouth move. Everything that we have is because God allows it to happen. And God allows us to do everything we do because he wants us to serve him. And we will never serve God like we should be able to. We will never reach our full potential for what God wants us to do if we are so enthralled with ourselves and what we can do. And Saul became jealous because he was so enthralled with himself that he said, I want to do that so that it can be about me. I want to do that so they can sing about me. I want to do that so that when I walk into town, all the ladies are singing how I have killed my ten thousands. And it poisoned him and it poisoned his friendships. All because he was jealous. And it's, it's amazing. It's amazing how jealousy can make you turn. Saul loved him. Saul, David was his friend. David was the armor man. And ultimately, he chased David to the ends of the earth trying to kill him. He was jealous. He never could get past it. Can you imagine what he could have been doing instead? Can you imagine what he could have been doing as a king instead? He could have been a great king, but instead he was so worried about trying to find David and kill David. Oh, watch your spirit. Don't be, don't become consumed with your pride in jealousy. I'm gonna move on to First uh, Samuel 17. I'm not gonna get very far. I understand 30 minutes. 30 minutes is my promise. I will not take more than 30 minutes. I have 12 minutes left to try and get through the first few verses of 1 Samuel 17. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shukah, Shukah and Bel- that Bel- and Bel- which belonged to Judah and pitched between Shukah and Ezekah in uh, Ephes Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and they pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. There was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. A cubit is about 18 inches. A span is about six inches. It's, uh, you can do this by yourself, actually. A cubit was the average height of a man from his forefinger to his elbow, like this. A span was the cubit that he had. A span was the length of distance he had between his uh, pinky and thumb, with extended like so. An average uh, cubit is about 18 inches, and this is about, I think it's six. It could be nine. I apologize. I thought I would know off the top of my head when I got here. I did not. I apologize. Um, all in all, it comes out to be about nine feet, nine between nine and ten feet. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head and was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. 5,000 shekels of brass. I did the numbers on that. Because 5,000 shekels of brass, I want to know how much was this, how much did this guy's uh, armor weigh? It weighed 125.7 pounds. This man walked around a battlefield wearing a coat that weighed 125.7 pounds. I'm not even sure if I can lift 125.7 pounds. I'm not even sure if you can lift 125.7 pounds. 
because that's a lot of weight. I'm not even sure if I weigh 125.7 pounds. He was, he put more armor on than I weigh. I, I just thought of that and that is, I am, wow, that is, wow, wow. Um, and that's what he wore as his armor. This guy was not just tall, this man was ripped. This man was shredded. He was jacked up. This guy could fight. He had greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him. That would be um, Goliath's armor bearer. He bore his shield. And he went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine? And ye servants to Saul? Choose ye a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me, and to kill me, then he will be your servants. But if I prevail against him, and kill him, then shall ye be our servants, and serve us. And the Philistines say, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of Ephraim, of the Ephratite, of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons, and the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And, th and the three eldest sons of Jesse went and followed so uh, Saul to the battle. And the names of the three sons that went to battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next unto him, Abinadab, the third, Shammah. And David was the youngest, and the three and the three eldest followed Saul. But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. And the, and the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself forty days. Forty is often considered the number of testing in the Bible. For forty days, this man, he went to the armies of the Philistine, he stood in the valley and said, Fight me. They, uh, essentially, he, we heard his whole speech. He said, fight me. Aren't you guys a servant to Saul? Come fight me. And if you fight me and you win, we'll serve you. But if you fight me and I win, then you will serve us. Now, we know this story. This is one of the most famous stories in the Bible. is David and Goliath. My only question is... Why did nobody else stand up? For yeah. 40 days, this man walked and defied the armies of Israel. For 40 days, this man challenged Israel, blatantly challenged Israel. And for 40 days, Israel cowered in fear. Cowered in fear. I'm going to keep reading down a little bit longer. Um... And I'm not, I'm not going to try and get carried away. I have six minutes left. We'll be out of here by 3.30. Cross my heart. But we're going to read down for a bit. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brother an ephah an eph uh, of the, this parched corn and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to thy brethren, and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of the thousands, and look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning, and he left his sheep with a keeper, and took and went as Jesse had commanded Commanded him. And he came to the trench as the host was going forth to the fight, and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage, and ran into the army, and came and saluted his brother. There is so much about David in this chapter. First thing that I want you guys to see is David did what his father said. Exactly what his father said. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now... I'm sorry. And Jesse said unto David his son, Take now for thy brother an ephah of this parched corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp to thy brother. That's what he told him to do. So David rose up early in the morning and went as Jesse had commanded him. 
exactly as Josiah had commanded him. The second thing that I want you guys to see about David, David did not leave things undone. David was David did not let his responsibilities fall to the ground because he had taken on more things. David's job was to watch the sheep. That was David's job in Jesse's household. You see that in 1 Samuel 16, what we talked about last week? We see that now. David went home from Saul when Saul went to battle to watch his sheep, to watch his father's sheep. And when David was going to return to Saul, to return to the battlefield, David did not just leave his sheep in the wilderness. David found a keeper for his sheep. David did not let his responsibilities fall because there was more. And then you see it again. You see it again in verse 22. His job was to find his brother and to give them food and to check on them and to find out how they fare. So David, David had his carriage with all his food, the ten lo and the ten loaves, the epaph of corn, the ten cheeses, and to find to the captain of the brother, captain of the guard to give it to him. And when David went to go find his brother, he did not leave that there. He did not leave it undone. He found somebody. He took it to the hand. He, David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran to the army. He did not leave it. The second thing that I want you to see, David did not come looking for the fight. David did not come. David did not go with Saul. David was Saul's armor bearer. We don't know why David didn't come with Saul. Maybe it wasn't time for Saul to go to battle. I really don't know. Maybe Saul didn't want to go to battle. Maybe Saul just sent David home. Maybe Saul thought he's too young still. He's my armor bearer, but he will serve me in the future. I don't know what Saul's thought process was with sending David home. But I do know this. David only came. He did not come for the battle. He came because his father said, go. And when his father said go, he went and did what he was commanded to do. Um, no matter how old you get, there's a pesky verse in the Bible. It says, honor your father and mother. And no matter how old you are, you are always supposed to honor your father and mother. You are always supposed to. You are never to be disrespectful to them. It, it, it. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. This is right. Obviously, you don't do anything that's against Scripture. I mean, that, that's the constant debate. That is constant. Like, like, what if my parents tell me, no, no, no. You follow the Bible. When you follow the Bible, you follow your parents. You, find, you will find, more often than not, the two line up pretty well. And David got that. David did not come looking for this fight. David just wanted to obey his father's command. So David went to the battlefield. And David brought his food. He left his sheep. He rose up early in the morning to do what his father said. It is 3.29. As I said, I don't want to keep you guys here. 30 minutes is my promise. I will go for 30 minutes. I know sometimes when I preach, I have a tendency to be long-winded. I am going to strive to not do that with these. In 30 minutes, it's my pleasure. Next week, we're going to get into 1 Samuel. I'm going to jump back into 1 Samuel 17, and we will hit the infamous verse, Is there not a cause? And David, David uh, challenged his brother. When his brother asked him why he was there, he said, Is there not a cause? And we'll be touching definitely on that next week. Thank you all for watching. I'll pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this opportunity. I thank you for the, for the scripture that you've given us. I thank you for the story of David. Lord. There's so much in these stories. There's so much to learn from David. Even as a young man. Lord, please, please, please help, uh, help us. It would help us to not be consumed by that jealousy that Saul was consumed by. And it poisoned him. It poisoned his friendships. It poisoned his relationships. So Lord, please help us. Please help us to understand that it, that it is our place to honor and obey our parents. That is our place. That is our task. And I thank you so much, God, for everything that you've done for us and for the parents that you've given me virtue. Lord, please help us to serve you. And do as you've commanded. In Jesus' name, amen.
You have a great day, guys.